Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain, aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. The Woman of Irori. Episode 187. Are they failing to notice that cheaper spell silver helps with literally any feature you might choose to enhance and with any other magic item you might want to buy? Or is the idea that since they could afford their favored enhancement anyway, making it cheaper does them a disservice since now lesser people will have it too? Imagine living like that. A strikingly handsome young man in a dress uniform taps her on the shoulder, which is more forward than anyone else has been. She spins around to blink startledly at him. Forgive me, he says, but I overheard those guests over there speaking of you with appalling disrespect, and I wondered if you meant to confront them and lacked only for anyone on your side. For if so, I would delightedly defend you. Hell was real. This is all fake, a performance, people trying to show each other how evil they are. She doubts Asmodeus can even see it. Oh, would you? I'd be so grateful. And he takes her arm and drags her into the conversation. Forgive me, he says, but I caught the last of what you were saying and had to emphatically disagree. There is no question, to my mind, that beauty alone would be insufficient to bring a woman to Her Majesty's attention. Surely this striking lady has many other talents as well, and need only tell us of them. Oh, I, um, that wasn't my objection. I just thought they were being rather crude, and I thought they'd forgotten that spell silver being cheaper helps with all those things they were talking about. Except prettiness, I suppose, since there isn't a magic item for that. So maybe someday every peasant will have a fancy headband and a fancy belt of strength and beauty alone will distinguish us. He laughs gently. Not intelligence, then. Spell silver being ten times cheaper, or even a hundred times cheaper, would not have peasants going around in headbands, and even if headbands were free, we wouldn't hand them out to peasants. Some people it's a favor to them, really, to let them go on being idiots. Is it? Yes. Why say that that Shackleborn there had failed to understand what was being done to him, and thought that all the viewers were friendly and that he was going to be set free any minute now? Would you enlighten him? No one could be that stupid. The noble blinks amusedly at the two of them. I'm certain that at least one person right here at this party is that stupid. It's really just a question of who and when they figure it out. The cleric sends the noble a quelling look and speaks rather more sententiously than before. If all in this world did wear headbands the equal of the crown of infernal majesty, it'd change nothing but the fraction of wizards and clerics. There'd still be fools to the slaughter. They'd just be smarter fools, and smarter butchers walking about to slaughter them. Asmodeus doesn't will that it be so. He only wills that we understand it to be so. Well, I think the peasants might not be Asmodeans if they were smarter. They might notice it wasn't in their interests to be the ones who suffer forever. I would say, well, Her Majesty also obviously did not pick you for your political opinions, but actually I suppose she might have. I'd say the obvious solution was not to give headbands to peasants, even once there's that much spell silver about. But if Osirian is handing out complicated farming machinery and giving headbands among theirs, I suppose if any countries who try that all end up like Galt, that'd be one answer to how we're to win this great game that's beginning. I hear tell that Carissa Sevar, who's said to be the inventor of the production line of headbands, did also invent the geezed earring. I'm no wizard, but it's an obvious thought to stack the intelligence boost and the geas into one item, if that may be done, once you're handing out headbands to peasants. Intelligence is to think of stacking a geas into the headbands. Wisdom is to see that you must arrange matters so that the peasants don't have any alternative, but to obey or suffer worse, no matter how smart they become. But if you're not more intelligent than them, you will think you've arranged matters so they have no alternative to obedience, when to them you're like a bear who has treed a tasty adventurer. Sure, as far as your bear mind knows, they're really truly stuck in that tree, 
but the adventurer is barely inconvenienced because there are so many solutions the bear can't think of. A horde of peasants who are wizards, even if you've geezed or threatened them all into line, is alchemical fire, the slightest contact with air, and up goes all of Teliac's in flames. The cleric nods, showing a deliberate grim smile. Yes, the problem is that right now we have headbands, and they do not. Giving headbands to all is equivalent to taking away ours, in how it changes the structure of power. I can only hope that with so much spell silver and wizardry, it becomes possible to build Hwasunade or Plunder Ten items as expensive as the Plus and Sixes are now, to preserve the present balance of power between the strong and the weak. Or mayhap Project Chemistry will learn to refine diamonds like they refine spell silver, and with so many wizards will gain a ninth circle to wish up the rulers. E. I don't see why we couldn't just sweep every farm with Detect Thoughts every week if we had a second circle in every settlement. We do chain soldiers and wizards to the world wound, by such means, including those wizards who perform detect thoughts themselves. We can chain smarter farmers to their farms. Seems better than putting all one's hopes in project chemistry, or whatever they're calling it these days, pulling off a second miracle as great as the first. If there's anything that project chemistry and the scientific revolution have promised us all, it's that we won't live in an age of just one miracle. It's which miracles we'll get that I worry of. No cleverness of wizards and alchemists will ever obsolete hand-to-hand -hand combat, of that I'm certain. But if one's got to swing some mechanical horror more complicated than an enchanted sword, next year's warriors may need more balanced ability stats than I, more intelligence and dexterity, less strength and constitution, and I might think to keep up with the right belt and headband, but the trouble is my enemy will have belt and headband too. Sir Pasqual, why don't you apologize to this lovely lady for calling her a fuck toy and let her be off with her equally lovely defender? I'm sure there's an interesting night ahead of them, one way or another, and I wouldn't want us to distract them further. Aye, fair enough. I apologize for naming you fuck toy, nameless thing of the queens. I would say I forgive you, Except, I think the church said recently that's a heresy. I've actually no idea what you mean by that, the man says as he tugs her away. Oh, I didn't intend you to. Well, if you won't reveal it before a larger audience, will you tell me privately what secret spark in you drew Abigail Thrun? She takes another sip of her wine. All right, but you must promise not to tell anyone. You have my word, my lady? She said that if I annoyed her, she'd turn me into a statue lost to the world forever and ever, and the thought consumed me with horror so totally I could scarcely think of anything else, which she thought was rather flirtatious. I see. And you don't suppose she'll really do it, as soon as the follow-through is more fun than the terror? Why do you ask? Oh, I don't know. Curiosity. Sympathy for such a beautiful thing, no less trapped than the Shackleborn. And not, I think, an idiot who can't see it coming. I'm not an idiot. I hear it's your first time in Igorian. Have you seen the skyline from the palace balconies at night? Well, this is a game no one else has tried. Is he trying to steal the queen's lover? Presumably he is aware that's a terrible idea. I don't think I'm supposed to wander off. Well, that's why I'm with you. And he tugs her firmly off towards a balcony. Surprise! There's a brief moment of horror-interested surprise in the ballroom as everyone stares at the corpse now collapsed on the ground in front of the pink-haired girl. Security, somebody says uncertainly. Apparently, I am in fact security for this event. A security who doesn't know the implications of pink-haired girl starts forward, then notices the Grand High Priestess and Queen of Cheliacs converging on the location and thinks better of it. I had thought you weren't allowed to do that, Lady Panita. At the least, I thought you had to give them a cookie first. Pilar gestures at the corpse of the woman she's just slain, in uniform of senior palace serving attendant. I didn't do it for her benefit, your majesty. I did it because a friend of mine is having a fun time at this party, and I wasn't letting her ruin it. Oh, now that opens up all kinds of new possibilities. Possibly? I'll have to think on it. Could you have had her taken for interrogation and malediction? She probably went to a good afterlife, I doubt I could have gotten away with taking her alive. Pilar realizes only after she says it that she didn't properly think about the question. Is that why your reading is being so very annoyed, Lady Pineda? 
She's annoyed for the same reason I'm annoyed, but we'll speak of that later. Snack service delayed them so that Carissa Sivar would be at the party, meaning Pilar could protect her. It needs not be spoken to anyone of wit what almost happened. The woman's corpse is lying in front of the stand, protecting the Helm of Brilliance, one of the more famously volatile magic items in existence. And now that Aspexia Rugaton thinks about it, why was that there in Nadal, and who did make the decision to display it at this party? Aspexia Rugaton wonders if there's such a thing as being so annoyed with chaotic good that you transform into a horror from the dark tapestry and start eating people. The hubbub caused by Pilar's appearance takes a while to filter out to the distant balconies of the ballroom, in one of which Carissa Savar is now making friends, or something. I've seen the type before, if you'll forgive me. Just sort of obediently walking towards their own doom because they're too terrified to think about whether they could avoid it. It's very pleasing to Asmodeus. To Asmodeus, that's you as much as me, I think. He laughs. Oh, maybe it used to be that way, but not anymore, I don't think. Word's gone out about how much Osirian pays for defectors, especially anyone who was close to the crown. A year ago, you could fairly have said of me that I was carefully not thinking about whether I want to leave. Now, I've gotten a sending with an offer. Why not take it? Well, it wasn't a very impressive offer. I do have my pride. Is he offering to defect with her? And if he is, is he doing it as some sort of game, or insincerity, or carefully not knowing himself? And if it's a game, what's the game? Has he figured out who she is, or does he just figure it'd be fun to spear it off whoever the queen's sleeping with? Carissa would like to clarify for listening security that she is, obviously, not contemplating defection, having just sold her soul to Dispatter and been offered all her dreams come true. She's just playing, as Abigail definitely intended. It's too bad how I don't trust you at all. It is. But you know, if I were you, I wouldn't be asking myself, Am I going to find someone I trust enough to ask them to save me? I'm going to ask, am I going to find anyone I trust more than this? You might as well go with the best chance you have, even if it isn't a good one. What do you get out of this, hypothetically? Money from Osirian, having pulled off something no one pulled off before. Axis, which I hear is very nice. Not you, if that's what you're asking. I've had my fill of fragile pretty things with nowhere to run. All right. I need you to say more than that. If you want me to risk my life, which is not nearly over, on this. I want to defect to Osirian, and will give you Osirian's defection payout for arranging it. I want to defect to Osirian, and will give you Osirian's defection payment for arranging it, she whispers. He beams at her, and then turns around to give an invisible someone a slap on the back. Pay out then, O oh ye of little faith. The slap breaks the invisibility. It's another man the same age, similar enough looking to perhaps be a brother. Oh, I don't know. I sense there's another twist impending. Deal was, I get her to agree to defect. If you wanted to reserve the right to declare she didn't really mean it, you should have been more specific. The pretty girl is sitting there frozen in horror. Abigail's going to be angry with you. Hmm. No, I'm on her good side. We provide a valuable service. We've tried half the palace slaves by now. I've been offered the title of anyone important I can swing it with, but it's honestly more fun to pick off helpless little girls. You, on the other hand, the queen is going to be angry with you. You lasted twenty minutes. That's worse than your typical bloodied, miserable kitchen slave. Truly embarrassing. I was going to report you. Yeah, yeah, tell it to security. Pay out, he says to his friend. End of the night, if nothing else happens. Want to make an additional bet on that? There's security visible on the balcony now. A squat man and a tall woman, neither of whom Carissa recognizes. Presumably, in case anyone pretending to be a defector, thinks about becoming one for real. Carissa wonders absently which level of the game they're on, whether Abigail briefed all the security about her game or not. What would Abigail's poor, innocent beauty do? She shrieks in frustrated anguish at them and tries hurling herself off the balcony. That's a double, says her erstwhile friend delightedly, as the security haul her back. I'm on a roll. 
Has my sweetling misbehaved herself? Abigail says to the impromptu gathering a few minutes later. To her slight surprise, she notes that some small part of her is glad Carissa is having fun. That's been an obvious possibility for some time now. But that it's obvious doesn't change that she's going to have to watch it very carefully. No, Your Majesty, I didn't, I wouldn't. Your Majesty, it fell for the Osirian defection line and then tried to jump off the balcony, the handsome man says cheerfully, bowing. Twenty minutes, a quite disappointing score. I'm terribly disappointed in you, my darling. I know you're tired and I sprung this party on you rather suddenly, but I hadn't thought it so awful that you'd sooner defect to Assyrian than stay around for it. I wouldn't. I was going to report him. I just wanted to see where he was going with it. Really? Nope. It was totally sincere. If he'd been for real, I'd have fled the country this very minute. I'd have come back afterwards, probably, but you dragged me to this party and deserved to have to execute some security about my escape from it if I really did see an opening. Dear, need I remind you that we're fighting somebody who's actually aware of us now and very nearly as clever as you? This could have been a layered plan by Keltum. When you think you've deceived somebody else is a very important time to worry about whether they've deceived you. It did occur to me, Your Majesty, that this might be a plan by Keltham, and it seemed to me that in that case I ought to let it succeed. I know you didn't want me running off with him before, but that was before I was soul-sold and had compacted with Asmodeus to own the souls of, oh, I think Aspexia wanted me to not bandy that part around publicly. Anyway, I got a very good deal, and no longer fear that Keltham could talk me lawful neutral, and it seems entirely possible that my unknown plan to seduce him starts with his rescuing me. Abigail sends out an emergency order through telepathic bond, receives an acknowledgement, coldly says, fail your will saves and I'll see if I can save your lives, and deep slumbers all four of the other people present. That's the death or indefinite statuing and loss to Cheliax at the cost of two sixth-level spell slots each, of anyone here whose memories we can't successfully erase with one sixth-level modify memory. I am taking the cost of it out of your pay. She didn't actually say the part that's the important secret. Your Majesty. You still don't understand what just happened. I am going to have words with Aspexia about this. She takes Carissa's arm, steers her away from where the fallen securities and informants will be saved, if that's possible, or statued if they cannot be, or executed if their lives aren't deemed worth it. Tell me of this compact with Asmodeus, Abigail demands once they're away, and a silence is about them. She looks scary by the standards of anything in Galarian, now, if perhaps not hell. Do you, Carissa Savar, conquer territories or hearts in Hell's name? Be you fairly judged by Hell's prince to be the most prime mover in such conquests, such unsold and unclericked souls from those lands and peoples as enter into Hell calling your name, in death as they called it in life, and did you and Hell, more service than disservice, shall pass into your custody or the custody of those in Hell you name your slaves or allies? And when you have conquered three quarters of Avistan, all such souls out of Avistan shall be yours as well. When three quarters of Galerion is yours, all such souls out of Galerion. When three quarters of this plane is yours, all such souls out of this plane. When three quarters of Phrasma's creation is yours, all such souls out of creation. While hell's dominions of those lands and peoples last, and all this be annulled should you fail finally after death in being acknowledged by hell as a hellish power. Or should the yield in strength and wealth from those souls granted you be less than he accounts as ordinary from his subservient powers of hell. Or should the prince of hell fairly judge you to have entered his despite in death or life. She recites from memory. She stared at the precise wording for a long time not long ago. Unholy fucking phrasma. You received nothing else directly from him? No circles of wizardry, no rites of command over deviltry, no artifacts? The rest from Dispater. Was this compact your idea or his? Mine. Then he is probably, probably going along with it only as speculation, humoring you perhaps, as it costs him no investment if you cannot do it, and he gains much if you do. 
But Asmodeus does not humor many supplicants personally, Carissa Sivar. I suppose that Aspexia was so horrified by the potential implications of the compact's contents, did they become known, that she forgot to mention to you the implications of the compact itself. There are probably some number of old ninth circles, ancient dragons, beings of the underground and its layered vaults, who've executed a compact with Asmodeus himself. Of those mortals walking Galarian, I do know of only two such. They are you and I. Your Majesty, you know I don't want your job and couldn't do it. Does everybody else in Chiliax know that? Believe that? Do you realize how dangerous it is to have an obvious successor? Anybody who'd rather you sit on the throne than I might try for a soul trap and rely on you reluctantly taking the job after none of the thrones succeeded in executing their own compact with Asmodeus. No, Your Majesty, I hadn't thought of that. But probably half the people in this room would have. It was available to think, just down a path she's not used to thinking down. I accept some part of this blame, for dragging you here exhausted from Dis, and Aspexia must accept some portion of it, for she should have made it clear to you at once if she is not playing her own fucking games. What else happened in Hell? Can you summarize it all to me? Despotter was amused, as I assume I'd calculated he would be. He was entertaining, offering me the thirty wishes and two headbands for the girls except Peranza and Asmodia, who he claimed Hell has, and who he accused me rightly of not wanting broken forever. He offered me one headband and fifteen wishes to throw the two of them in and make it so they've been in safety in the gardens of Aracura. I refused, obviously. Snack service showed up and said that the half deal served Asmodeus better than the first one, at which point Dispater refused me the first one. I thought about what else I could ask, in light of how he'd been apparently willing to go for the thirty wishes before Caden intervened, and asked that the devils at the gates of Abaddon tell people they could go to Carissa Savar, and that I get anyone who accepted if I succeeded at becoming a power in hell. Dispater said he couldn't do that because of the incentive against law, but would compact with Asmodeus on my behalf for souls that cry my name in lands I conquer. He did that, and returned with a response. He presented the compact for 1664, 15, wishes offered through three roundway gates, permanent tongues, and arcane sight. To me, I made some revisions. I renounced Irori and got a vision from him. I signed. Snack service bargained with Dispatter. After that, I don't know what for except apparently both the timing of my return to Galarian and the flesh shaping were part of it. I repurchased the souls of everyone on Project Lawful and arranged cheap options on security and mailol, exercisable only with your approval and aspexias. Dispatter says Peranza and Asmodia have always been in the gardens. Everyone else who I claim is going to be non-consciously petrified until it becomes obvious I'm not, in fact, going to turn into a power in hell capable of using them. Oh, and Dispatter declared me his favored possession so that none in Dis or Avernus will impede me. No obvious explosive runes there, but I'll need to review all of this in much more detail after this party is over. I'll tell Aspexia that I require of her that report, if she was there for all of it. Abigail Thrun sighs, leans against one wall, and hits her head against it hard enough to crack the stone. Not so hard amending wouldn't do, or make whole at worst. As regards the timing of your return from Dice, there was a plot to detonate a helm of brilliance in the ballroom, at least I assume that's what the plot was. Pilar shut it down by slaying the spy. No cake, just death. Pilar said she could do that because her friend was at the party and having fun. She said that in hell, too, that she can use her pseudo-prophecy powers for her friends. I am very worried Caden's pushing her to break with us, but I don't see anything obvious to do about it. Has she shown any signs of disloyalty, slippage, overt or subtle? Nothing I'm sure is that. In this, she seemed slightly bothered, I guess. But I would have been, too, six months ago. Well, that's either dreadful foreshadowing, or it's somebody being slightly bothered inside of hell as I hear sometimes happens. I'm going to check with Aspexia if she considers herself to be monitoring Pilar's character arc, 
and if she's not or doesn't have the time, then I'm going to assign you to the task. And do you know what we're going to do now, Carissa, after all this upset? Go have more fun? Don't steal my thunder. You're supposed to say what and not skip to the punchline. It lacks drama. As I was going to say dramatically, we're going to go back to the party to celebrate Cheliax's conquest of Nadal, and also, as they'll be told by the end, your sale personally of your soul to Despotter. And as they are not to know for a time, your compact directly with Asmodeus himself. We'll go back to the party and celebrate all of these things, as we were before this complication happened. I decided when I threw this celebration that if I was tempting tropes by daring to celebrate anything, then so be it. And if by inviting you I was calling their attentions directly on us all, so be it. And that if by my telling you that you might have me after or be had by me, I was tempting some romantic complication to occur in our lives immediately after, so fucking be it. I'll not live the rest of my life cowering from all fun, for fear of plot complications, for fear of humorous or tragic comeuppance, if I'm ever seen by the story to be enjoying myself or celebrating anything. We're going back to the party and we're having fun, I was going to say. But now I suppose it falls flat and the tropes take us all. I wouldn't say it fell flat, Your Majesty. Whatever I am, it's what you made me. And so I suppose it's not very surprising that I'm having the time of my life. Did you find anyone worthy of our mutual attentions yet? We'll need a victim if you're not just to be mine own. You trick them too often. They all suspect something. There's probably something among the men who were looking at me like they're not used to pretty things they can't touch. But I have yet to conduct an extensive survey. I want to say that they ought to have courage and storm ahead. But I must admit that I am in fact laying a trap and maybe not an especially subtle one. I am a little tired myself, too, to be honest. You're allowed to go hunting, you know. Find one you'd enjoy hurting or want me to hurt. Lure them into some arguable sin against you or I. You command and I obey, Your Majesty. I'll not escort you back. We can't be seen returning together, after all. Also, be it clear that, if we're interrupted before we can conclude this tryst, I'm declaring right now in front of any possible audiences or readerships in the dark tapestry or beyond that the event was overly predictable, and the writers are hacks. Abigail lays a brief kiss upon Carissa's lips and goes back to the victory celebration. And Abigail's lover will go a-hunting. She'll get herself some more to drink, and drink rather more than is a good idea, and wander towards the men whose gaze she was flinching from earlier, out of old Carissa habits of avoiding people like that, stories that start that way. She's untouchable. It's safe. She can wander right in, drunk, while powerful chelish nobles eye her hungrily, and she is the dangerous one. It feels like there's some important insight about Asmodeanism here. She is so very interested in hearing about all of these people's gossip. He'll make his move when Abigail's beautiful, harmless-looking, slightly drunk, nameless possession is listening wide-eyed to some skeptical, wary, chelish noble's account of what she might have to fear at Igorian's court if she dares to get herself more involved there. Alexite Gellius Rutilus Thrun Irwine. You know, the one you really ought to be worried about in the palace, I'd say, is Carissa Savar. He knows. He has to know. He's met her. She doesn't look that different. So he's playing a game, too. You know, fair enough. You think Carissa Savar would be jealous? Chelish Noble, Irwine. I hadn't heard myself that Carissa Savar was the jealous type. Rumor certainly doesn't proclaim her to be monogamous. Well, she's more dangerous than she looks, is the thing. I was among the first to see Carissa Savar after she came into Chiliax, do you know? When I was but about my own business eating dinner, I saw her. Most of the fools in the palace refectory did laugh at rumors and make a show of paying her no heed, or pretended to meddle by demanding of her to know which rumors were true. I was one of few there with the sense to keep well out of her way. Many of those faces I never saw in the palace again. What does she look like? Just, you know, so one might be especially cautious not to give offense. It's said that her beauty falls barely short of Abigail Thrun's, and that only because she doesn't wish to give the queen offense. It's said that she bears a crown forged in hell, 
only barely less mighty than the crown of infernal majesty, and that only because she doesn't wish to give offense. And she's a brunette, long hair about yay high, holding out his hand to what happens to be Carissa's exact height. You'd know her on seeing her, I'm pretty sure. She's not the sort who could walk into a gathering like this one without every single eye turning in her direction. I am grateful for the warning. I have no desire to make enemies in Igorian. Really, I'd much sooner be stowed away on some country estate, but Her Majesty does like her games. Unfortunately, whether or not you are Carissa Sivar's enemy is entirely her choice and not yours at all. How do you all bear it? Going around being terrified all the time? Worrying about Her Majesty and Carissa Sivar and that's the cake girl over there, isn't it? The one that killed someone to stop a spy plot. Being a Thrun helps a lot. I'd say that I highly recommend it, if not for the incredible implied treason. That was the cake girl? I thought she gave people cake, not death. Well, sometimes Project Lawful girls just get mysteriously upgraded. It happens. Is it so mysterious? I imagine they were generously rewarded for giving the crown Nidal. And the cake girl was rewarded by being upgraded to the cake or death girl? Well, how else would getting promoted on Project Lawful work? To this stunning logic, I have no rejoinder. I've heard rumor that Carissa Sivar hasn't been seen in Cheliax for a month, for whatever that's worth. I don't know that I'd feel so reassured, actually. She's probably being upgraded. To what, I admit, I have no idea. Maybe tending to her cult in the Padisha Empire. Don't ask me why she has a cult in the Padisha Empire. I just know it's sizable. I do know, but the Church has proclaimed it grave heresy to repeat even as rumor. This sounds worrying says Alexite Thrun, who is, in case anybody's lost track of this important fact, visibly a priest of Asmodeus. Should I be worried? Yes, but it's not my place to speak of it. I grant you leave to speak of it, Alexite says to Carissa Sevar. If it pleases you... I suppose it would have to be the rumors that those who follow Carissa Sevar will come into her keeping when they die and go to hell, and that she has mercy for the souls under her care. Which is nonsense, I must say, from everything else you've said of her. Carissa Sivar can't be a merciful person. No power in hell could be. And I can't imagine her admiring those who delude themselves and believe things just because it's comforting. If one wanted to be useful to Carissa Sivar in hell, well, this is a party. No time for speaking of such things. I have heard it said of her that she dislikes it immensely that Hell's souls are lost to Abaddon and that she has hopes her cult might guide those souls back to Asmodeus where they belong. But that's hardly unique to her. Abaddon is horrid. I hadn't heard the Abaddon part. Lady Sivar wouldn't much like the plans of the mayor of Sanara, then, would she? Conveniently, the Most High Aspexia Rugaton has also been spotted at this gathering, so how about I go find her and ask her about this incredibly dangerous heresy? By your leave, lady. She waves him off cheerfully and turns to the other noble. I'm not familiar with the name, but do tell. The more people Carissa Sevar dislikes, the less likely she is to take some issue with me. Mayor of Sonora, Earwine. Sad, pathetic, and dare I say non-Asmodian. I rule a town half of whose inhabitants are descended of devils in some way. Nigh a quarter are outright tieflings, and they don't sufficiently fear hell. Asmodeus' embrace should be a privilege for them, one they have to earn by good behavior, I say. And you, you sad, fragile thing of the queens, how dare you tell me otherwise? Do you think being buried a statue is the worst that can happen to you when the queen tires of you? Be grateful she'll show you even that much mercy. You could be sent down to hell for a stay, brought back when you're fully broken, and plane shifted to Abaddon then. Well, you know what I think of you? I think that everyone here is some kind of sick twisted, parody evil, somehow neither in Asmodeus's image nor in their own, and you're the worst of it. You thought about what the most vaguely horrible thing you could do was, and it's not even lawful evil, it's just bad, when you should be grateful to have a population that knows their place and is glad to go and find it. You have a rare gift, if you really do have a population of people who don't much fear hell. And you are wasting Asmodeus's resources if you maledict even a single one of them to Abaddon. If I ran this country, it'd be outright illegal. If Hell thinks they don't deserve to be in Hell, it can destroy them itself. If you ran this country, you traitorous wretch, 
and heretical besides, for the purpose of hell is to be feared, to strike dread into the hearts of traitors as they contemplate the slightest act of disobedience, knowing that any such will condemn them to eternity as suffering blobs of meat. If they can't manage to fear that, Asmodeus has no use for their defective minds, and hell is better off spared the effort of trying to process them. The purpose of hell is not any attitude mortals have about it. Have you even asked the church if they want you maledicting people to abaddon? I am pretty sure Asmodeus can manage to scare them if he wants them scared. The priest of my town understands the importance of keeping order, and that the degenerating conditions in my city born of insufficient terror have left me no choice but to find something they'll fear more than hell. It's his fault in the first place, really, for failing to convince the souls in his keeping that they'll become lemures for disobeying their superiors, namely me. But once the fools see the worst dissenters being put to Abaddon, they'll fall in line. It sounds to me like you're incompetent, flailing around to blame anyone but yourself, and picked a particularly odious problem-solving approach which won't even solve your problem, which no one is calling you on because, ooh, we're evil here. No one's allowed to point out when anyone else's evil is stupid. And you've heaped enough insult on me, future statue. So here's how it's going to be. I have no idea of your real relationship to her infernal majestrix, and no intent to offer her any insult. I certainly won't suggest to her that her ending for you be anything but what satisfies her the most. But I'll inquire of her infernal majestrix of your family, your friends, if you've none of those, anyone you might care for. You seem like the good-hearted sort to have many like that. And then I'll pay of my own expense to have them brought to Sonara, invent some crimes, and offer up their souls to Ariman. You're pretty, though. So does her infernal majestrix consent you may beg leave to serve me of a night, and if I'm satisfied you've shown full repentance I'll spare any two family or friends of your own choice. This is the price of insolence in Cheliax. I didn't intend any insult. You were warned, you kept at it, and your repentance comes too late to spare more than two of your treasured souls at best. It does give me a fine idea about destroying the souls of offenders' families as well. Hmm. <laughs> You'd best be about before you give me any more ideas, really. They didn't do anything to you. They're good Asmodeans. Yes, and this is Asmodeanism. The cruelty is the point, you sad, sad thing. The girl races across the ballroom towards the queen. He'll watch from a distance, not feeling very nervous. He has carefully not transgressed the bounds of courtesy to her infernal magistrix, whatever the girl's true nature. Even if she's some manner of bait or trap, he has offered no treason and no heresy. The nameless pet is evidently a natural beauty, and somebody like that is not likely to be a chelish power in her own right. Lightning doesn't strike twice. He cannot, of course, overhear the queen's conversation, but the condescending pat that the queen gives to the pretty girl's head is plain enough. And then she'll trot back, with the queen with her. Abigail Thrun looks distantly bored, as is a common appearance with her. If it's your will, your majesty, tell him he can't maledict my entire family to Abaddon, that's not Asmodian. I'm Cheliax's crown, not its church, my beauty. You'd want to make that demand of Aspexia Rugaton, and she's a deal harder to seduce. Abigail chuckles briefly. He asked, Your Majesty, if you'd permit me to spend an evening with him. In exchange for not maledicting your family to Abaddon? The mayor kneels, formality does not call for it here, but he does it voluntarily. In exchange for not maledicting two of them of her choice. Obviously, I'd offer no such compact if it did not please your great majesty to whom I mean no disrespect. Your overt manner this day was that you meant this thing to suffer. Be that not your true plan, I offer no dissent. She has offered me insult, treason, and heresy on the surface of things. This, on the surface of things, would be my reply. Ah, uh, yes. She's offered me insult, treason, and heresy, too. One of her more attractive features when it came to bedding her, really. You have my leave to spend a night with this one, beauty mine. Your choice, of course. Is it, he said, your manner was that you meant this thing to suffer? You look a little tired, my dear. Shall we dance, and then perhaps close out your part of this evening, and send you to my bedchambers to await me? I'll be along after I've had the time to hear out a few reports and you look like you could use a rest before the night's rigors. As you wish, your majesty. She'll firmly pull Carissa off to the ballroom floor 
and have a security unobtrusively tap Carissa with Cat's grace before she tries to dance. You're drunk and tired and having some trouble playing your part consistently even with glibness up, Abigail murmurs to her by message. That wasn't nearly a voice of horrified realization and resignation. I don't understand why you want to draw it out, Your Majesty. I found who I want. What's the wait? We need to teach you how to play with your food properly. I suppose teaching you how to eat at all ought to come first, and maybe try when you're less of an adorable ball of exhaustion. Be it clear, I did instruct you to relax and have some fun, but don't try any social maneuvers while drunk when you're not so instructed, Carissa. I can choose myself to forgive your sloppiness. It doesn't mean that you weren't sloppy. I understand, Your Majesty. I am not actually under the impression I know this game well enough to not immediately make a mess of it if I were trying to play for real. Do you actually want me to learn? In your place, I'd be pleased about having some insurance against troublesome Carisse. There's a lot of things Abigail Thrun could say here, would have said here, in some less hazardous neighboring universe in which there weren't tropes pressing down about her, where she had nothing to fear but causality. She never wanted to die of old age on her throne, for that would mean she'd played her game too conservatively and lost out on most of the possible fun. I think I don't want you to learn now because you don't have time, she settles on. I've said what was needful. Now put those thoughts aside and dance with me. Savor the moment, the impending reveal, the last moments of the game before it ends. Your enemies think all is going well for them, and that was always your plan and their pride goes before this fall. As you command, Your Majesty. I won't hurry too fast about those reports, so you've the time to close your eyes for a nap after this, if not asleep. And when the night's second part begins, I'll show you how to take apart a man to his core, if you mean to put him back together afterwards, having learned his lesson and mostly intact. And do a few other things, too, of course. Are you the sort who'll enjoy him watching you in pleasure while he suffers? I have no idea, Your Majesty. Maybe. He did ask for a night with me, and I wouldn't want to not deliver what was promised. We'll see how it goes. What did you think of Chiliax's nobility? I'm not going to be surprised or insulted if they fell short of your standards. They aren't aspiring to my standards? The thing they're aspiring to seems messy, to me, and incoherent. But... I assume getting people to embrace lawful evil as part of their identities and motivations at all is hard enough, and it's too hard for some reason to make them embrace some version of it, which is less petty and performative. Petty and performative. Yes, there's a possible whole person who acts like the mayor of Sonara acts, out of a kind of pride and grandeur in being the worst person possible, more neutral evil than lawful evil, but whole. There's a version of him who makes a threat like that, because he takes an artistic pride in destroying somebody as absolutely as possible. He's neither of those people, though, just grabbing at any thought of evil that passes in his mind, the moment it passes his mind, even if the thoughts don't fit together. I won't say that the state of the nobility isn't my fault, or even that it wasn't my choice, but it was my choice out of a serve-yourself shit buffet with the triumph of Nadal's conquest, the external threat from Osirian, our internal explosion of spell silver, I have the political momentum now to do some things I couldn't before. Like issuing them with intelligence headbands and forcing them to actually wear the cursed things. If they can't otherwise keep up with changing times, wisdom would be better yet, but I dare not. That's what I told the mayor, actually, that he wasn't evil either in service of Asmodeus or himself, that it was pathetic. No one in hell is trying to prove how evil they are. I think you can't risk wisdom headbands yet, but maybe once I have something to offer them that isn't heresy and that people don't notice is made of sand if they think about it too hard. Again, Abigail Thrun speaks none of her thoughts about what she prays to be the trope-foreshadowed destiny of a compact that Asmodeus himself might have thought was only humoring this woman. Whether Carissa will become someday an empress who judges Abigail's suitability as queen, or become lord ruler of Galarian, or leave Galarian with an army to conquer some other place for hell. And whether come that day she'd have Abigail with her as advisor, or leave Abigail behind as regent. 
or have long since ceased to think of an obsoleted and discarded administrator of the Chelish region. Abigail says none of it, for if she says it, it's less likely to happen. There's all too many twists the tropes could play on them, if Abigail speaks it aloud, and makes it an expectation that must be subverted. And to say any such thing would also push Carissa's pride far, far ahead of what her present position justifies. Carissa herself, no doubt, is carefully not thinking any such thing, and that makes it Abigail's place to read ahead in the story and think those thoughts for her. Abigail dances her evening's first and last dance with Carissa and keeps her thoughts to herself while the music plays. She's not a particularly good dancer, but with Kat's grace up and the queen leading her, she can play her part. As for thoughts on the evening, those will have to wait until it's over. She's drunk and tired. When the dance ends, Abigail sends a silent command to her mages, and magical silence is laid upon the ballroom and all its levels. It lasts ten rounds, long enough that anyone can and should make their way to a balcony to hear the announcement that's obviously forthcoming. Though looking down, the queen still stands in the dance floor's center, with a fragile-looking beauty held in her embrace. It's a gentle, intimate stance, and anyone who sees Abigail thrown like that will guess correctly that someone is about to suffer in an artistic fashion. The other dancers draw even further back, amid the silence, to create a suitable stage for whatever comes. Magical silence ends, and the queen speaks into the waiting hush that remains. How did you find the party, my dear? I hope it was not too tiring. It was delightful, your majesty. I do apologize for springing it on you after such a long day and exhausting endeavor. Very rude of Nidal to pick just then to end the war. How went your trip to the big city? As I'd hoped, and then some. I did some shopping, witnessed some marvels, toured a palace that, if you'll forgive me, surpassed yours. There's a barely audible whooshing sound, half a ballroom, drawing in shocked breath simultaneously, but saying nothing. Some of the other half are starting to catch on. Did you find the buyer you sought for your own wares? Without difficulty. You should have seen the rug in his waiting room. I could have stared at it for a thousand years and not wholly comprehended it, and rather hoped he'd have me wait at least a few days so I could try. He hears the god pronouns and his heart, already chilling, freezes over. Well done. Lord Despotter does not treat with many. I hope it was worth all the waiting. That fine headband. Was it that which you received in exchange? It's a mighty price for a soul. She permits it to assume its proper form, now. Six to six four. Less than the crown of infernal majesty, but not by very much. What, this? It was part of our agreement. Not a large part. Substantially less than half. Abigail releases her further from her half-embrace, turns her gently to show her the whole ballroom, or rather, show the whole ballroom to her. One first introduces the lower-ranked person to the higher, in etiquette. Lady Carissa Savar, commander of Project Lawful, who is now fully and irrevocably of the Infernal Empire. I present to you the assembled nobility of Chaliax. Nobles of Chaliax Carissa Savar. Now go catch some sleep, dear. She would really like to teleport out, but tragically the whole palace is forbiddenst. Also, she hasn't actually hit Fifth Circle yet, but in the haze of the last few days, that started to feel like more of a trifling inconvenience that'll fall at her feet sooner or later. Instead, she inclines her head to the queen, takes in the faces of the crowd, and then walks out. They get out of her way. And the victim of this evening's entertainment is the mayor of Sanara, who did attempt to extort one night's dalliance from Carissa Sevar, and, alas for him, succeeded. Console him all your best. Various events then occur of a nature deemed unsuitable for the sensibilities of gentle souls, such as many readers, and also the authors. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.